What's up everybody out there in YouTube land? My name is Jeremy and I'm here with my new YouTube channel Tie-Dye Tanks and I'm going to be doing a video series called Tie-Dye 101 where I'm going to show you some of the basics of tie-dye. Today we're going to be doing equipment. What, what do you need to start tie-dyeing? Well, there's a lot of stuff that you're going to have to get to start out with. Um, now, most people will go out to Walmart or uh, their local craft store and buy a kit, a tie-dye kit. Uh, and depending on what kind of tie-dye kit you get, those can be good for starting out with for a beginner. They usually come with the application bottles that you need, the soda ash on some of them, the dye, um, some key things that you need um, to start tie-dyeing. And the best kit that I can recommend is to find a jacquard kit. Jacquard sells kits that come with the three primary colors lemon yellow, fuchsia, and turquoise. And they have a few rubber bands in them. They, it comes with soda ash, it comes with um, some application bottles that are marked. And there's even an extra bottle that you get so you can mix dyes and make different colors out of those three dyes. Uh, and that's the best one that. I would recommend that you get. Uh, now I'm going to explain uh, to you what kind of equipment you should get, especially if you want to take your dyeing up a, up a level and you don't want to just get a, you know, a tie-dye kit. You want to get some professional dyes and stuff like that. So to start out with, of course, you're going to need something to dye. I started of course with t-shirts which is what most people start out with. This is a Gildan heavy cotton t-shirt. Um, I also use ultra cotton or tagless Gildan or you, you can use whatever shirt you want. Um, you can use Fruit of the Loom, Hanes, um, I, any kind of cheap shirt you find. Um, but. Uh, if you start making tie-dye to sell, you might want to get a little bit more high-quality shirts like the Gildan Heavier Ultra Cottons, Gildan Hammers. There's a lot of um, like nicer high-end shirts that you can buy too that are like ring spun cotton and stuff like that. You can also get material to make tapestries. Uh, you can dye bandanas, you can dye pretty much anything that's cotton, hemp, linen, or rayon, or that has a cotton polyester blend that is more on the higher end for cotton. Uh, say 60-40 cotton would be a good one, um, but 50-50 and lower than that, you're going to start getting into a lot of fading. Uh, and after that you're going to need something to tie your material up with. That's where your rubber bands come in. Everybody knows that tie-dye is rubber band happy. <laughs> Everybody uses rubber bands to start out with and that's okay because that's that's what you should start out with. Now there's a lot of people that use uh, string I, I know of a couple people that use it, uh, actually Carl McClellan, Mr. Tie-Dye, on, on uh, YouTube he uses string. I use rubber bands still um, for almost all of my designs that require rubber bands. For designs that I want to get these white lines in, like these circular patterns right here. I use artificial sinew. Artificial sinew is a wax string. It's polyester and it's coated with beeswax. Um, it's coated with the beeswax so when you pull it tight it will actually cinch on to the shirt and it resists the dye in the areas that you tie it with to make these white lines like you see right here. 
this is a staple for a lot of dyers. A, a lot of people use sinew. In fact, there are some dyers that I see that only use sinew, and that's just fine. Um, I like to mix up my designs and a lot of the backgrounds I use uh, for my hand painted designs which you'll see in later videos uh, are just tied with uh, <laughs> good bands. Um, <clears throat> there's also other things you can use to tie like I said string. Uh, some people actually uh, use string for everything. Um, there's a couple other things that I'll show you along the way for more advanced techniques like stitching, uh, where you'll use like a thread needle, but I won't get into that right now. I'll show you that in a different video. Now, after you've got everything tied up, you um, have to pre-soak your shirts. Now, let me tell you something before I move ahead. You can pre-soak your shirts before you tie them or after you tie them. It's not going to make much of a difference. I pre-soak before I tie in the dye fixer, which I don't have an example of here right now, but it's called Soda Ash. Soda Ash is a key component in tie-dye. It, act it actually bonds the dye to the cellulose in the fabric. Uh, what it does really is raises the pH and the raise in the pH is what actually bonds the dye to the cellulose but you need to have the soda ash for that to work properly. Now soda ash can be found at several locations. You can actually find it at pool supply stores. You can get it from most of your dye distributors, uh, like Dharma Trading Company, who I will discuss their dyes here in just a minute. You can get um, Arm & Hammer Super Washing Soda, which is the same thing, and you can find that on most of your store shelves in the laundry detergent aisle, as it's usually used as laundry booster. Uh, soda ash, like I said, is very key. So. Like I said, you can soak before and then tie, or tie and then soak. Either way, as long as you get the soda ash into the shirt, that's all that matters. Okay, now t the next thing you're going to need is dye, of course. And like I said before, there's going to be a lot of places you can go like Walmart and get cheap dye. Rit or Tulip are the two big ones that people get all the time that are, are just not, they're not going to work in the long run for you. If you're doing some sh shirts for kids or maybe like a party or something like that, I would say go get Tulip dye and, you know, just make it as cheap as you possibly can. But if you're looking to get into this, like I said, seriously, you want to get... Procyon MX cold water dyes. They are a fiber reactive dye and this is going to be backwards because I have the um, mirror image on my phone right now. But uh, this, um, these dyes are from, from Dharma Trading Companies but there are several dye companies that you can go to. I will put some links in the description of all of the dye companies that you, you can get dyes from. The, these uh, Procyon MX cold water dyes are going to be the dye that you're going to want to buy and stick with because they are going to um, be the most vibrant in color. They're going to last the longest and basically every tie dyer that knows what they're doing is using some kind of Procyon MX cold water dye. Uh, now these, um, I don't know the price of all of them off the top of my head, but m most places sell them in 8 ounce, 16 ounce, or 1 pound sizes. Uh, and this one right here, this is an 8 ounce size. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 2 ounce, 8 ounce, and 1 pound. The, the, the two ounce sizes are a little bit smaller than this, they're a small container. The eight ounce are this size, and the uh, 16 ounce or one pound are in a larger container. Um, when you get your dyes, um, you 
are going to need to mix them. And uh, to mix them, you're going to need a measuring cup to measure out water. You're going to need a teaspoon or other type of measuring spoon to to measure the powder dye out. And you're going to need a funnel to put the dye into whatever you're going to put it in, which is going to usually be a bottle of some kind. We'll go over that in just a minute. Um, and I suggest that you get like a white, this is just an example one. I have two of these, the other one's dirty. Uh, get a wider mouthed one because they tend to be easier to put the dye down into the bottles. This one, it's a little bit harder. I have some problems with it sometimes, but uh, I still use it. <laughs> okay, now you're going to need um, some kind of application um, equipment like dye bottles or uh, paint brushes or something like that. So what everybody normally goes with is the the bottle and there are several different sizes of bottles you can get. I believe this is an 8 ounce bottle. This is a 16. Uh, there's also smaller 1 ounce bottles that you can use for for uh, for detailed applications, um, I think they even have 32 ounce bottles, huge bottles. Huge bottles. I don't use those because I just don't think they're practical. But uh, you can get these bottles from your dye distributor. Usually, um, you can find some bottles too at craft stores, but usually they have to be threaded. Uh, with a thread tape because they don't hold as well as these bottles do. I like I like these bottles just be, and um, I'll put a I'll put in the description where you can find these bottles. I get them from Dharma Trading Company though. <clears throat> and then there's going to be some other things you can use for advanced application techniques, uh, like a modified syringe. I use this for my dye application because I like to be more controlled. Uh, it's just a food um, it's just a food injector and I cut the tip off with a Dremel Moto tool and uh, I have to replace these every year or so depending on how much dye I do with them but they're awesome I love working with them. And for more advanced techniques you can use brushes a foam brush is very popular in the tie dye world with some with some dyers. They like to use that to um, apply their dye. Um, I've used them before, mo mostly to do black on shirts where I want the black to be more subtle. And also regular paint brushes I use for hand painting designs, as you see on this one right here. This is a hand painted logo. I have several different sizes of brushes and kinds. Um, I even have some nicer brushes for outlining and things like that. Um, and if I'm going to hand paint or use brushes, I always suggest you get a smaller container to put your dye in. These are nine ounce tumblers. Uh, I get them probably every two years or so. I get new ones. These are washable. You can wash them out and reuse them all the time. And they are um, the stack up so you can store them easily. Okay. And after you get done dyeing your shirt, you are going to need something to wrap it in because um, your shirt has to batch for at least 24 hours. Um, in another video, we'll go over all the basic steps of actually dyeing, tying, all that stuff, but I'm just explaining equipment to you right now. So what I use is plastic grocery bags. Remember to recycle these when you're done with them. <laughs> some people actually will wash them out and reuse them. Uh, some people will use Ziploc plastic bags, Tupperware containers, Rubbermaid containers, things like that just as long as you have something that's going to cover your shirt so it can batch properly, you can use that. 
Now, the, the, there's a couple of pieces of equipment that uh, people in the hobby debate upon, and one of those is plastic gloves or latex or nitrile. Um, and the, the reason they debate it is because they think, oh, well, I'll just get my hands dirty in, you know, in my craft while I'm doing my craft. Well, if you have a regular job, uh, say even like in food service or something like that, you know your hands are going to have to be clean. So I always wear these when I die if I'm working another job. Right now, because of the lockdown from COVID-19, I'm not working at my other job. So I have been... I'm um, not using gloves sometimes, I don't know if you can see, but my finger's a little purple there. <laughs> but if you are going to handle soda ash, I always recommend to wear gloves, because soda ash can be very caustic for people whose uh, skin is already sensitive. I have sensitive skin, and it burns my hands whenever it gets on my hands, so I always wear gloves when I handle soda ash. Um, there's not really a lot more equipment that you uh, can use in tie-dye. I mean, I've gone over pretty much everything. The, the most important things are having a space to work with, a space to batch your, your shirts in, and a space to rinse out in. Because th those are three major tasks that you're going to have to do while you're tie-dyeing. Um, and you want to be as comfortable as you can when you're doing this because especially if you make these shirts every day you're gonna be you know like crouching over and things like that and you don't want to do that as much because later down the line you're gonna have injuries to your knees back stuff like that so you want to try to um, maximize your workspace as much as possible I usually die on this table right here. I have a batching rack that I batch everything on and I rinse outside usually. Uh, and of course I use my washing machine. I'll definitely go over a rinsing and everything on some of our other videos that we do here in Tie Dye 101. <laughs> so that's about it though on the equipment today. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to be doing some more videos on the basics of tie-dye, like basic folds, how to dye, how to prepare your shirts, uh, and then we'll get into the more advanced tactics and things down the line. I'll teach you some things that uh, I can do, like the hand painting and the stitching, of course. Those are the two big things in tie-dye that people are... are uh, struggle with because they don't want to try it at first and once they do they love it so if you like this video give it a like if you want to see more from me you can subscribe uh, I'm going to be making more videos they're gonna get better I'm gonna get better equipment and I'm gonna be editing I'm a, every day I'm learning something new about editing uh, so, if, like I said, if you like this video um, and you want to come back and see more, subscribe and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.